Good morning, church. Welcome to Louisville United Methodist Church. My name is Kara Chamberlain. I'm the associate pastor here, and I am so glad to see all of your faces here this morning for worship. What a blessing it is that we can be together, that we can join together our voices in song and in prayer to a God who loves and sees and hears each and every one of us. As we prepare our hearts and our minds for worship this morning, I'd like to share a few announcements with you. We have some very fun and exciting things going on where you can engage with our community of faith. This afternoon for children and youth, and anyone who needs a little Christmas spirit, we're going to have a Christmas in July party in the fellowship hall from 4.30 until 6 o'clock p.m. We're going to watch the newest animated Grinch movie on the big screen. We're going to eat some Christmas cookies and drink some cold hot chocolate, chocolate milk. So if you would like to come and be a part of that, you would be more than welcome. We're really excited about it. For our older men division of the United Methodist Men, they are going to have dinner together at Alex's just down the street this afternoon at 5 o'clock. And if you have any questions about being a part of that group of United Methodist Men, you can reach out to Ed Smith. He would be your contact. And this Wednesday, our Echoes group, which is our senior adult group, is going to meet for lunch at the 2520 Tavern in Clemens at 1130 on Wednesday and Nan Johnson would be your contact for that. We have lots of exciting things going on at Louisville United Methodist Church and even more exciting things in the works for the fall. So friends, I'm glad you're here, and I invite you now to stop for a moment and prepare your heart and your mind for God's presence in this place and for our worship together.
stand as you are able to join me for the call to worship, which is printed in your bulletin. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me, and know my thoughts. See if there be any wicked way in me. Church, our first hymn is O Spirit of the Living God, which is hymn number 539. It's different than what's printed in your book. 539. <laughs>
to greet your neighbor and share the peace of Christ with one another. And at that same time, I invite all of our children to come down front for a children's moment. Choose kind words when I talk to everyone today. What do you think? Good idea, bad idea. Good idea? Okay, I want to touch the hot stove when I make Christmas cookies later. Is that a good idea or a bad idea? It's a bad idea. But I really want to touch it. It looks so cool. It's you know, kind of red and glowy. I want to touch the stove. What can, can I do it? Is it a good idea? No? Are you sure? <laughs> well, guess what, friends? You each and every one of you, you are winners in our game today. Give yourself a round of applause. Good job, good job. You won. You are winners because you told me the truth about my bad idea of touching a hot stove. Good job. Friends, you chose to be honest. Even when I was being kind of annoyed, right? I said, I really want to do it. I really want to touch that hot stove. Henry was just shaking his head. He said, Pastor Kerr, don't you touch that stove. It's not going to go well for you. Thank you for telling me the truth. Now, friends, we always want to be people who tell the truth, right? Is it always easy to tell the truth? No, sometimes it's hard. Maybe it's hard because you might get in trouble for whatever you're having to tell the truth about. Has anyone ever broken something and mom or dad found it? And they said, who broke this? And Millie, I know it would be easier to say, Henry broke it, right? <laughs> but no, that's not the truth. You have to say, I broke it. Friends, today, Pastor Paul is going to share with us a story from the Bible about someone named Nathan. And Nathan was a prophet. And prophets are people who tell the truth, even when it's hard. And sometimes we have to tell the truth even when it's hard. Even if I would have kept annoying you about wanting to touch that hot stove, you had to tell me the truth and say, no, Pastor Kara, that's not a good idea. So friends, as we hear this story about Nathan today, I want you to think about how you can be a person who always, always tells the truth. And what do we call those kinds of people? People who tell the truth are what? It starts with an H. Honest. So we want to think about how we can be honest people. Sound good? Okay, why don't we say a prayer together and then you can go back to your seats, okay? Let's pray. Dear God, open our hearts and our ears that we might hear the story of Nathan and that it might inspire us.
to be people who tell the truth, even when it's hard. Thank you, God, for this beautiful day. And all God's friends said, Amen. Okay, friends, thank you for coming and sitting with me. I will let you go back to your seats now, okay? All right, and we turn as a family of faith to our joys and our concerns. Uh, of course, we want to lift up the families um, that are grieving the loss of loved ones from this past week. Debbie Weston's family, um, who passed away, we announced that last Sunday. And then Ronnie Evans, who passed away on Wednesday and um, had his service here um, yesterday. So we want to lift up both of those families, everybody who loved them. Um, we know that they are at peace with the Lord Jesus and that we will see them again. But for us, um, we hurt. And so especially we want to remember those families. Are there other joys and concerns that you all have to lift up to the, the rest of the church family today?
we have messed up along the way, and we ask for your forgiveness today as we remember together the prayer that Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Sisters and brothers, God is good. All the time. All the time. God is good to each one of us. God sent us Jesus and gave us grace and forgiveness and joy to get through each day. One way that we give back is through our tithes and offerings. Um, we have these stewardship moments that uh, wonderful fellows have been preparing for us every two weeks. You can read this um, and just do a little bit of reflection on what Paul to live as generous people. On the back of your bulletin, you can see our tithes and our offerings. And um, we had we were running ahead for the year of our giving, and then in June we dropped behind a little bit. So you can keep an eye on that in your bulletin. The offering box is now in the back instead of passing the plate. But we thank you for supporting the ministry here at the church. <coughs>
give you thanks for everything that you have given us. And now we offer just a portion back into your hands. We ask that you would take it and use it to build your kingdom through our church here in Louisville. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. You may be seated, and we're going to sing our hymn of preparation number 354, I Surrender All. Join me in the prayer for illumination. It's printed in your bulletin. Lord, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as the scriptures are read and your word proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you say to us today. 
Amen. The scripture today comes from the book of 2 Samuel in the Old Testament. We're going to start in chapter 11, verse 26, and then finish up in chapter 12, verse 13. When Uriah's wife heard that her husband Uriah was dead, she mourned for her husband. After the time of mourning was over, David sent for her and brought her back to his house, and she became his wife and bore him a son. But what David had done was evil in the Lord's eyes. So the Lord sent Nathan to David. When Nathan arrived, he said, There were two men in the same city, one rich, one poor. The rich man had a lot of sheep and cattle, but the poor man had nothing, just one small ewe lamb that he had bought. He raised that lamb, and it grew up with him and his children. It would eat from his food and drink from his cup, even sleep in his arms. It was like a daughter to him. Now, a traveler came to visit the rich man, but he wasn't willing to take anything from his own flock or herd to prepare for the guest who had arrived. Instead, he took the poor man's ewe lamb and prepared it for the visitor. David got very angry at the man, and he said to Nathan, As surely as the Lord lives, the one who did this is demonic. Another translation would be as good as dead. He must restore the ewe lamb seven times over because he did this and because he had no compassion. You are that man, Nathan told David. This is what the Lord God of Israel says. I anointed you king over Israel and delivered you from Saul's power. I gave you your master's house to you and gave his wives into your embrace. I gave you the house of Israel and Judah, and if that was too little, I would have given you even more. Why have you despised the Lord's word by doing what is evil in his eyes? You have struck down Uriah the Hittite with the sword and taken his wife as your own. You used the Ammonites to kill him. Because of that, because you despised me and took the wife of Uriah the Hittite as your own, the sword will never leave your own house. Skipping down to verse 13. I've sinned against the Lord, David said to Nathan. The Lord has removed your sin, Nathan replied to David. You won't die. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. So people, you know this, are complicated, right? People can be complicated. I, um, one of my favorite books growing up uh, was a book that we read in school, To Kill a Mockingbird by Harper Lee. Many of you probably read the same book in school. I don't know if they continue to have kids read that today, but, um, but it's a classic. It's a good one. And of course, it tells um, the story from a little girl's perspective named Scout. Um, and she kind of gives us a glimpse into small town southern culture from the 1930s. And um, as I read it, kind of a hero of mine from that book was her daddy, Atticus Finch, who to me just seemed like the embodiment of honor and courage and goodness. And um, of course, you know, you may have seen the movie too and seen Gregory Peck, who just kind of does an amazing job. Uh, in that character's role um, as Atticus. But you may also remember a few years back, there was another book that was published by the author, Harper Lee, who happened to be a a lifelong United Methodist. Um, But it was, they waited until after she passed away, so it was a little bit controversial that then they published, after her death, this other book called Ghost Set of Watchmen. And as I read that book, you know, it tells the story of a grown-up scout when she is 20, in her 20s, early 20s, and she returns back home after living in New York City. She goes back to Alabama and has to really come to grips with the complicated reality about her father, about Atticus. You know, that he was not perfect, um, but that he reflected a lot of, you know, the, the biases, the prejudices, particularly the racial prejudices of his own day. Sometimes we see things as children, you know, and as we grow up, they become a little bit more complicated. We realize that about people. Um, And we've seen that through church history, too. A lot of our heroes in the church uh, that we lift up and we venerate 
of a complicated past. You look at some of the founders of the big Protestant churches, Martin Luther, who you know, was terribly anti-Semitic in his writing. Uh, John Calvin, who started the Presbyterian Church, had somebody executed in Geneva. Uh, and then you have John Wesley, who started our church, the Methodist Church, and at one point when he was a missionary in Georgia, the colonies denied communion to his girlfriend because she was getting on his nerves. So <laughs> he said, no communion for you, you know, which I didn't know you were allowed to do. But John Wesley did that, so save that story for another day. Um, and we see that same complicated history in some of the heroes of the Bible. This sermon series, we've been looking at these different heroes from the Old Testament we can go back and look at Abraham who lied about his wife in a really kind of underhanded way. Um, then later you, you go down and Jacob who talked about him and how he cheated and tricked his brother. And you saw Joseph who was just annoying. You know, Joseph was the baby and, and all his brothers hated him because he was constantly talking about how his parents liked him the best. Um, maybe if you're an older sibling you can relate to that. I don't know. Um, then we skip down to Moses. You know, Moses, that great leader in the wilderness, but Moses killed a guy in Egypt. And, and Rahab, of course, has her own shady past, which we've discussed as well. Um, and then last week, last week was our hero was David. Uh, we talked about David and Goliath. And today, as we pick up this story from 2 Samuel, you know, we find ourselves not at David the shepherd boy fighting off Goliath, or, or David being anointed by Samuel as the next king of Israel. We don't even find him sitting in the palace in the shiny new capital of Jerusalem that David helped to found. But instead the story begins at another house near the palace, where we meet a woman who is carrying a terrible burden. She has been abused by a man with great power, and she carries the violation of that abuse in her because she is pregnant. Not only that, but her husband has gone off to fight in a war for the same powerful man who took advantage of her. And on this particular day, as the story opens up, she receives a knock at the door and grief upon grief as a soldier comes and tells her that her husband is dead just collapsing into grief, you know, um, Bathsheba is her name, just begins to cry and to wail. Well, all the while, that powerful man, King David, silently watches and waits until after the period of mourning is over, he sends for Bathsheba to come to the palace to be his wife, and she gives birth to his child. And David thinks to himself, well, that worked out all right. <laughs> um, nobody saw, nobody knows. But of course, someone did know. Someone did see. Scripture tells us that what David had done was evil in the Lord's sight. So God knows, and God sends a prophet named Nathan, who is our hero for today. Um, and a prophet has a really tough job. You know, a prophet is, sometimes we think about prophets as predicting the future, but really a, a prophet is just somebody who speaks God's truth. And sometimes that truth is really hard to say out loud. If God gave the prophets a message, sometimes they were killed um, for speaking up and telling the truth, especially if you're talking to the king who has the power to have you executed, right? So God calls our hero Nathan, the prophet, and gives him a message to go and deliver to King David. And David welcomes Nathan into the palace. He's seated high up on his throne, ruling in the name of the Lord, you know, feeling very pious, King David is. And Nathan comes strolling in, and like a lot of preachers do, he starts out by telling a story. He says, there was once two men one guy who had everything. He had flocks and herds full of cows and sheep. And another man who was poor and had nothing. Nothing at all except for one little lamb that he raised from birth and fed from his table and kind of carried in his arms and snuggled with him. <laughs> he said it was like a, a child 
to it. It's all he had. And then one day, the rich man decided that he was going to throw a party because some friends came into town. And as he was thinking about planning the party, his eye fell not on one of his own sheep, but on that one little lamb that belonged to the poor man. And he said, that's the one. That's the one that I'm going to serve up for supper. And as David is listening to this, remember, he's a former shepherd, right? And so he's getting mad <laughs> as he's listening. He's getting more and more angry. His heart is beginning to churn inside of him. And he's used, he's the king, right? He's used to handing down judgments. And so he gets real self-righteous and he says, that the Lord lives, this man, whoever he is, deserves to die. And of course, the irony, we the readers, we're already in on it, right? That David the king has just pronounced judgment on David the rich man from Nathan's story, which sets up, you know, one of the most dramatic moments in scripture where, you know, Nathan sticks out that bony finger, you know, off of the throne and he says, you, you are a man. It's a powerful moment, Right? We don't know exactly what David is going to do, what the king is going to do, and Nathan doesn't stop talking. He keeps on. He says, in fact, God has sent me to tell you, David, to remind you how he is the one who gave you everything that you have. God says, I made you king. I delivered you from Saul. I gave you this palace and, and all that you have, and I would have given you even more if you had asked me. But instead, you took someone's wife who's not your own you had a husband killed, and you weren't even man enough to do it yourself. You sent him off to die at the hands of Israel's enemies. And David is listening to all of this, and his heart is beating faster. And you have to think that his own words were echoing in his, in his ears. This man deserves to die. It's as if Nathan has taken David's own words like a scalpel and turned them around and it's just cutting away all the hypocrisy around David's heart. And in that moment, this great and powerful king humbles himself and he confesses to the prophet, it's true, I've sinned. I have sinned before the Lord. And instead of meeting David with, with judgment, the prophet receives another word. A word of hope. He says, the Lord has taken away your sin, David. You will not die. So yes, people are complicated. David, the greatest king in Israel's history, but he wasn't perfect. He wasn't perfect. Far from it. But you know, I think that, you know, I don't think you ever plan for all of those things to happen. I think just like with a, a lot of people in the world, maybe even some of us, it starts out with something small. You know, one, one indiscretion, one mistake. You went up to the roof of the palace and saw that she um, But one thing leads to another, to a bigger mistake, and a bigger mistake, and you try to cover your tracks, and before you know it, it spiraled out of control. And So I, I have to bet that if you were to go up to David and ask him to kill an innocent man, he would have recoiled in horror from just like he recoils in horror from Nathan's story. And that's because it's easier, I think, for us to see the faults of someone else. Right? We can see that guy in the story. <laughs> what a jerk he is. Um, you know, a lot of us, I think, are probably like a scout. Um, and we grew up with somebody that we look up to, somebody that you idolize and put on a pedestal. It could be a a parent, your mom or your dad, a relative, a pastor or a teacher or a neighbor, friend, somebody that you look up to but who ended up hurting you and letting you down. And you had to come to grips with that truth that, that people are not perfect. Right? People make mistakes, all of us do. I don't know if any of you are watching the new TV show Loki. It's uh, superhero shows. When we're talking about superheroes. About Thor is the god of. You know, uh, he's a superhero in the Marvel universe. But his brother Loki is always getting into trouble. And in the second episode, I just started watching it this week. He has this line where he says, "Good people 
no good person is good all the time. No bad person is completely bad all the time, right? In other words, he's saying that we are a mixed bag. We are good and bad. We have the capacity for both love and selfishness. That's true for all of us. But, you know, I, again, it's easier to see that in somebody else than, than in yourself. I wonder if there is somebody that you have in your life, and you can think of somebody who might get on your nerves, <laughs> who is easy. You can see their faults very clearly. Right? It's easy for you to, to judge them, to criticize them, even to condemn them. Because their faults are right there and open for everybody to see. But chances are, you can think of that person that you are not all that different from them, or at least as different as you might think. Um, because just like David, sometimes we'd rather focus on their faults than on our own. Until, until... Nathan comes strolling up in your house, right, and points that bony finger in your face, right, right past David, and he's pointing at all of us sitting in church today. For you, Nathan, you know, might come in the form of a, a trusted friend, um, somebody who can, who can tell you the honest truth that maybe you don't want to hear. Do you have a friend like that? Um, sometimes it's a spouse. <laughs> is the only person or, you know, that can just be completely honest with you, like, that was a big mistake, you look really dumb when you did that, you know, or whatever it is nobody else can tell you, but you need somebody who will tell you the truth and that moment of truth can also come in, in a time of clarity, it can come in church, we hope, you know on a Sunday sitting in a pew, it can come in therapy it can come in a hike you know, up on the mountain, it can come while reading a good book but the thing about the truth is, whenever you come to grips with it, is it's like a mirror. You know, the truth is like a mirror that, that holds itself up to you so that you can, you can see your own hypocrisy. You can see those mistakes that, that you try to hide or you'd rather forget all about. And I have to think that this scripture today about David and Nathan, it's one of those mirrors. You know, it's a chance for all of us to look in the mirror and say, you know, and we have a choice. We have a choice. You can get mad and you can get defensive, or, or you can be like David and humble yourself and admit the truth. You know, that yes, it's true that I have sinned, that I am not perfect, and that I'm in no position to judge anybody else. Because that is the truth, isn't it? That all of us are complicated. All of us are human. But the thing is, if you are willing to humble yourself <coughs> like David did, then your story doesn't have to end with guilt and with judgment. But instead, there is that other word, that word of hope, that the Lord has forgiven your sins and that you shall not die. Sisters and brothers, that is the good news for all of us sitting in church today. That's why we come back again and again, no matter what mistakes we've made, because God's grace, God's love that none of us can earn is bigger than all of our mistakes. And that means that in the middle of our complicated, messy lives, God is holding out a new beginning for you and for me today. Thanks be to God. Amen. We're going to sing one of those old songs. It's me. Not, not the preacher. <laughs> it's me, oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. <laughs> I'm not as new in love as we could be too. We'll stand and sing together.
God into your week. Go with this good news that God's grace is bigger than every mistake. That God offers you a new beginning today. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.